so much, Jen. Um, I appreciate the kind comments. I must correct that, ladies. I was not a keynote speaker. I was uh, one of the ambassadors at the Gatehouse. There are 12 of us who were handpicked by Lisa Rose, who is the founder of the Gatehouse. And there are 12 of us, ladies, who sit on that board. And um, I was uh, part of that group that helped facilitate that event to where the governor was our special guest, the mayors of Dallas and Fort Worth, and our own beloved Mayor Tate spoke at this event today. It was a glorious day. I can't tell you all the love and all the excitement and all of the anticipation of what God is gonna do. And today, I feel like I was telling my friend Cheryl and Cindy on the way over, I was like, I feel like I'm witnessing history today. I'm being a part of a history-making event, not only at the Gatehouse, but actually here today at this Hackberry Creek Country Club. Because today, ladies, my life comes full circle today. I'm gonna tell you the story of how, what I mean about saying that and what it means for this me to be here today on the tail end of the Gatehouse grand opening as well. I want to say hello to my friends, Cindy and, uh, excuse me, Nancy and Mindy, I'm sorry. They're my friends uh, on Main Street, Grapevine, and uh, we have been in business, both of us on the street for quite a while, and we're dear friends. And almost at each table, I have a friend that I have, uh, Roxanne. Roxanne and my family go back no, no, we don't go back this far, but they go back to the 40s, the late 1940s, 50s in Irving. And some of you I've gone to church with, and we have fellowshiped together in years gone by. And so it's, it's an honor to be here today, Jen. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Could you, I had already mentioned that today was the grand opening, this morning at 10.30. And as I began to look around the property today, I began to think of all the ladies that are gonna be coming there. Ladies who have suffered in their relationships, in their lives. Many things have happened to them and their children as they come to the gatehouse to live their life here, to make a permanent change. And I began to think about some of the circumstances that they had gone through when you make it to the gatehouse. Some of them have lost their, their families. They've been abused. And I, I began to think of difficult times I had faced in my own life of losing my mother when I was seven years old. And then of the verbal and sexual abuse that I suffered and feeling so alone and so scared. I was terribly scared when my dad killed my stepmother and then he pointed the gun on me. Those are times that we, we walk through in our lives and that these ladies at the gatehouse will walk through times like this, have already done it, and we're looking to make a change. So I titled my, my talk today that I'm gonna do, Overcoming Adversities in Life. How do we overcome adversities in life when things happen to us that we didn't ask for, we certainly didn't deserve. And things happen and it's, it's not good. I believe that we overcome them by accepting Jesus and by the word of our testimony according to Revelations 12, 11. Every time I share this story, I become a stronger person. And this is a story that goes back oh so many years ago. But yet, God has taken care of things. And today, I live free. I don't camp out in my tragedies that I, I experienced. You know, I thought I had a normal childhood. My mom was 40 when I was born, and my dad was 47, and my oldest brother was 22. And can you ladies imagine what how they felt when they're having another baby? This would be number five in this family. My youngest brother right above me was only 10 years old, so 22, 10, and then we have Debbie here. So my mom was a strong Christian and she is the one that I credit with her prayers and her godly example of how she 
She uh, raised me for just seven years because she got cancer not long after I was born. I remember cobalt treatments in Dallas back then. They treated it with cobalt treatments, and I don't know, I don't think they even do that anymore. But uh, my mom was very sick, and had she had a hysterectomy early on, she would have probably lived to be older than 47. But at that time, women's issues, our health issues, our examinations and all that, they just didn't go for that back then. You know, it wasn't a part of our care. It wasn't a, a part of how they, they did it back then. And so I actually grew up on MacArthur Boulevard here in Irving. Okay, does anybody know what the name of MacArthur Boulevard was before it was MacArthur Boulevard? A uh, Carpenter Road, exactly. Now, Bonnie, did you say Carpenter Road? Did, did you, you said, okay. Carpenter Road, it was a two-lane asphalt road. And uh, it didn't come, this was all country out here. This was all farmland. And uh, we had about 30 acres there, and that's where I grew up. And uh, there's a street now named after my dad, not far from where I grew up. My mother died, as I said, at the age when I was seven. And I'll never forget this time. As we gathered around her bed, all of my brothers and sisters were there. And she said, I have prayed through for each one of you. And when you pass, you will know Jesus, each one of you kids. She looked at my dad and she said, I shudder to think what he's going to go through before he dies. But he will know Jesus as well. And it wasn't but a day or so my mom went to be with the Lord. Now, before she left, she made my older sister charge over me, who lived across the street from me. And so um, my sister oversaw my care after my mother died, and I lived with my dad. So that we lived across the street from each other, so it was very close. About two years later, my dad remarried a wonderful Christian woman. And... Um, she loved me. She took really good care of me. She had five sons, and uh, she always wanted a daughter, so she took very, very good care of me. My dad decided that we would move out of Irving, and we would move to what is now DFW Airport, where the airport land is. For those of you, does anybody know what it was before it was the DFW Airport? Do you know what we called it? What we call it in Grapevine today? It was the Grapevine Prairie. And so where DFW Airport is, where the city of Grapevine owned the most, or people from Grapevine city limits owned the most part of the airport, along with Irving Coppell and I believe Grand Prairie. But Grapevine owned the most of that. So eight acres and a new house out there, and I was going to Cannon Elementary. At this time, I'm in the sixth grade at Cannon. And uh, during those days, my dad had most likely high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and he, you know, he didn't drink a lot. He didn't, I don't remember drinking at all, actually. Smoked cigars, but not drinking. Um, he, um, he had some health issues that were not addressed. And so, and, and again, we're talking about the mid-1960s, okay? And so one day I came home from school and our house had been robbed. I found the house, I got off the school bus, and I found the house that had been robbed. And I went through the house, and um, we got the police out there and everything. They stole guns, and they stole television from us. And just, they went through the whole house. My dad always said that my stepmother's sons did it, or had it done. And um, <clears throat> my, my stepmother, it was around Easter time, 1966 and my stepmother had a meeting with my dad and I and said that she would be leaving and that I could go with her or I could stay with him that she was going to leave. Prior to this time there had been some people and I only found out about this about a year and a half ago. There were some letters that were being written to my brother and to my dad and we they labeled the letters they call them letters to blue eyes. The blue eyes in our family is a family trait. And the letters were addressed primarily to my brother. And if we got a letter like this today, 
I'd be at the chief's office immediately saying, what are we gonna do about this? But in the 60s, people kind of took matters in their own hands. They wanted deeds to property. They were demanding deeds to property. They beat my brother up on one of the letters and I talked about it the next day. And there were even letters, there's 12 of them, and you can put them kind of in sequential order. So he, my dad, was being bombarded with this, with, I, I guess if uh, the letters, they, they wanted the deeds, and that's what they wanted. They wanted, I guess in the 60s, you could have done something with them. And so they demanded that, and um, along with some money and other stuff, but, so we have that circumstance of my dad's health issue, the robbery, and then the people asking for those deeds. And so it was one morning early in April, of 1966, my stepmother tried to get into my bedroom and my dad shuts the door on her. I got ready for school that morning, I put my clothes on, and it wasn't long before I heard a scream and a gunshot and breaking glass. And I didn't know what had happened at first, I, I, I didn't know, because my dad had been up all night with his gun, walking around the house all night long, looking for those people that were out to get us. He would later in the grapevine jail tell the police officers there were 500 people out to get him, and there was no one. He said there was a group of people at the back of our property who were out to get us, and there was no one there. He would later be diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. If you've ever been around anyone like that, they always feel like someone is trying to get them, trying to get them. Um, he came around the corner and he leveled the gun at me and he was chalky gray with blood red eyes. And I did the only thing I could possibly think of. I said, Daddy, Daddy, it's Debbie, I'm Debbie. Later on they would tell me that's probably the best thing you could have possibly done because in his mind, those people were out to get us. And they later said she, he could have viewed her as one of them. I cried so hard, he ended up locking me in the bathroom because I couldn't quit crying and I was trying to just process what had happened. I went over to the window during this time and I unlatched the door, the, the window and I was about to run. Now remember we're on the Grapevine Prairie and there's maize fields around the house. And I was gonna to run to my neighbor up the street. In 1966, there was no 911 and we had one telephone and it was near where she was at. And I was afraid to go there. And so I unlatched the window and I started to run. And I believe an audible voice spoke to me and said, if you go, he will kill you too. He was an expert marksman. And so I unlatched, I locked it back and I just cried and cried and prayed and cried until I didn't know if I could do it anymore. At this time, I'm 11 years old and uh, my dad had prearranged for a man to come pick us up. And that man came and we came out the door with two shotguns and a pistol. And the man looked very frightened and I got right behind him and told him what had happened on the way to the jail that day. My dad asked to go to the Grapevine Jail, which was on Main Street, not far from where the business, our business is today on North Main. And um, so we were headed there. As we're headed north, there's a car on another street headed west that we could see. My dad said to that man, he said, pull over. So the man pulls over and he levels the gun out the window. I truly believe if someone had come down that street that day, there could have possibly been another person killed that day who had nothing to do with what was going on with us. We headed to the jail and, um, and I went straight to the dispatcher and said what had happened and how to get to the house, but it was too late. My dad told them at that time that there were 500 people that were af after him and there was no one. He would be taken to the Tarrant County Jail and I never saw him again after that day. 
I never, I never laid eyes on him again, but I had a reoccurring nightmare. And that nightmare was, I was on the stand and they would ask me, did he or did he not? And I would look over and I was seeing that chalky gray with the red eyes. And I would wake up and I'd be scared to death. He actually died 10 days later in jail. The night before he died, he called for the pastors of the church or they came and he prayed and he accepted Jesus that night and he died in his sleep. Mm -hmm. My sister came and picked me up at the jail and I went to live with her. And uh, at that time, I moved three times after my dad died in one year. I went to Travis, Crockett, and Bowie Junior High School right near Irving. And I had to move three different times. My family was moving me around. I finally lived with my brother for a period of time. I couldn't stay with my sister. They wouldn't allow it at that time. And uh, when I was 13, this is where the verbal abuse came in. I had someone that was telling me, oh, you'll just probably end up pregnant and on drugs. And I remember thinking, I don't know why they would say that about me. I was an honor student. I wasn't doing anything to at all. But that's how those negative comments that you can speak over your children, your spouse, or whomever, you can speak that to them. And if, if it, they internalize that, it, it can come to pass because what you say, the power of your words are so great. And so I just remember things being just so bad, I had no clothes. Now, seeing all these clothes over here today was just amazing because I remember the day when I didn't have hardly anything. And my dad had left money. I should not be poor. I should not have anything to wear. But it was very difficult. I, I had almost nothing. So I just felt like I didn't have I didn't have anything. I didn't really have anything going for me. There didn't seem to be anybody in my court that was saying, you know what? And at that time, in the 60s, there weren't friend, friends like my friend Cheryl here who does counseling, who talks to children to, to try to help them through circumstances like this. There was nothing that I recall like that at all. And I just felt like I just wanted to run away. I just wanted to leave. I, this is so bad. I, I wanted to leave. And so I began to, I called this my crossroads. This is what I call what happened what I came to at this time. Am I going to run away? Or am I going to go back to that little church that my mom took me to many years ago? And so I contacted one of my mom's friends who loved me and loved, she loved my mom and she came and picked me up and took me to that church. And so at that time, I accepted Jesus and I asked him to help me with all those bad things i would just been through and give me a new life and let, turn things around to where I could have a normal life and I could go on with my life and have a wonderful life. At that time, I had no idea how wonderful it was gonna be. But I got saved, I, I accepted Jesus and uh, I got filled with the Holy Spirit which gave me an extra power and I truly believe something that a lot of churches now call Freedom Ministries, it could be under a different name, to where you go back once you're saved, once you're saved and you've accepted Jesus, you go back and you revisit that time that was so painful, that was so hurtful, and you give it to God and He takes care of it. And then you can like shut that door and you don't go back there and open that door. You can think about it. You can talk about it like I'm doing today. But that's not something I carry around with me every day. I, I rarely think about all the things I went through during that time. So here I am, 13 years old. I go on to MacArthur High School and graduate. I meet my husband, my high school sweetheart. We married in 1972. We have two sons and four grandchildren. In 1984, I started in the jewelry business in Irving at Northgate Beltline. And 
1992, I came to the jewelry store as the manager, and um, I work there. I've been there now for 23 years. I had always loved history, even as a child. I loved it. American history. That was before I realized how important Texas history is. I was doing American history. <laughs> But now, being a proud, proud Texan, I'm a sixth generation Texan, I love history. And in Grapevine, as Nancy and Mindy know, as, as many of you know, we celebrate history and we love it. I have very deep roots in uh, Grapevine. I was sad when I left Irving in 2003, and I was really sad, and I know that's kind of crazy, but I was sad. I, I left my home of 27 years here, and, and I moved on. I did not know what kind of ride I was going to be in. Once I left Irving and, and I really plugged in Grapevine, I did not know. But I had very deep roots there. I found out that my great, great, great granddad, Reverend David Myers, was the first Baptist minister into Dallas. This is before First Baptist Dallas. This is like 18 Christmas Eve 1845 it is on my mother's side I was trying to make it into the daughters of the Republic of Texas and that is on my mother's side he is considered the father of the Baptist denomination in Dallas County and it is significant in Dallas Tarrant, Tarrant, Collin and Denton County he would ride out to Dove and Lonesome Dove in South Lake. And he would hold the first service of the Lonesome Dove Baptist Church. Not related to the movie. <laughs> Lonesome Dove Baptist Church in February 1846. Mm -hmm. That church is still going on today. Mm -hmm. And the cabin that that meeting was held in is on Main Street in Grapevine. It is the Torian cabin. And it just so happens I'm the keeper of that cabin. Oh, and I decorate it seasonally. And um, I always have a really special feeling when I walk in there. Because who would ever think it? You, do y'all remember when Emmett Smith, that show, So You Think You Know Who You Are? Mm -hmm. Remember when Emmett Smith went back and found out who he was? It was at the exact time that that show was going on. Then I found this information out. And so, you know, sometimes when you think you're kind of insignificant or you may be not really that important, not that I feel like I'm that, I don't want y'all to think that about me, but look at the history and look at what we have, things we don't even know to pray about, things that are out there that we don't even know they're there, God, brings it to us and let us know. At the jewelry store in 1998, we bought the historical building. In 2008, I actually bought the business for my brother-in-law, so we own the building and the business. Do you remember me telling you about the house I was gonna run to when, when we had the incident and my stepmother was killed? A lady, this happens quite frequently, a lady came into the jewelry store. We got to talking, as I do, and if you want to talk history, I'll, I'll talk it with you for sure. She said, I used to live out on the Grapevine Prairie. And I said, you know, I did too. I was a child. She said, well, I was a teenager at Grapevine. the very best you can for, for others reaching out to your neighbor and helping them do things they cannot do, taking them to a, a doctor visit or taking a meal. There's all kinds of things that we can do to show the love of Jesus throughout our lives. I, I truly believe that the difference in my life and why I was not a statistic as many people are when they go through such things in life, I believe it's because I asked Jesus into my life and asked for forgiveness. And I believe this is what's going to make the difference at the gay house. And so the reason I talked about it coming full circle is I'm going to share this testimony with the ladies. 
I'm going to share with them how God turned my life around. He'll turn it around for you and your children and your children's children. We're going to draw a line in the sand, and we're going to make a difference here in this metroplex area throughout the state and actually the United States. It's not just for Texas. I allowed the Holy Spirit to deal with my circumstances in my life. And today I live free. And so I want to talk with you about anything that you may think of, that you may be dealing with. I can assure you God can take care of that. And so I'd like for you as I'm closing, I would like for you to just bow your heads with me and let's just pray. If you feel like you need to talk to God and to accept Jesus, I have a prayer that I would like you to pray after me. Father, I know I've done things that are not right. And I ask you to forgive me of all the things that are hurtful, that things that I've done and maybe things that have been done to me. I pray, God, that you would forgive me and just give me a new life. I believe in Jesus and I believe what Jesus has done for me. I thank you for this gift of Jesus Christ and for forgiveness in my life for today and for all the days to come. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.